Hey, we want to take just a few moments to say thank you for choosing to worship with us here at One, whether it's in person or via our YouTube or podcast. Uh, I was asked just last week, what is one word that describes One? And I believe with all my heart that one word is family. And so my prayer, our prayer, is that you experience, whether it's in person or one of the many other avenues that you have to uh, experience worship with us, that you feel like a part of our family. Remember, go with God and you can't go wrong. I'm going to give you message two in our new series called How to Neighbor. I'm going to do it very quickly this morning. Message two, or as quick as I can. James 1, 27. James, the half-brother of Jesus, come to saving knowledge of Christ or in Christ. After the resurrection, he didn't believe in Christ. Kind of hard sometimes when it's a family member. Uh, James would write, most of scholars believe that the book of James, this actually is the first book, it's the first series I ever preached. I was at Corinth Baptist Westminster. We were meeting downstairs because they were renovating upstairs. And I remember going, I'm introduced because this is what my training, my seminary education taught me was to exegete the truth and to preach a book at a time. I don't know if they do that at other seminaries, but that's what they said to do. And so James, James is known as the Proverbs of the New Testament. It's practical and it's how we are to live. It is, it is to be our attitudes as we, uh, it is to be the actions in our lives. So this one particular verse, I'm not going to pull it out of context, but I'm going to pull it out, highlight some things, and you're going to, I want you to buckle up and listen because some of you may write me off right away. I promise you God has a word for you this morning. James 1, 27, say amen if you're there. Well, all of you can say amen now. It's on the screen. Say amen. 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 Here we go. Poor and, <laughs> pure, poor, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. What I want to focus on, leave that up there. What I want to focus on this morning is caring for orphans. Caring for orphans. This is what he says. This is what religion, this is what God looks at. This is what he wants to see from his church, that we, that we care for the orphans and for the widows, those that cannot care for them. The two at the, at the end of the spectrum, those that, that most people check into a home and forget about. That's a whole sermon in itself. I, I, we've done years of ministry in a nursing home. Family members hardly ever come and visit. They just chunk them off in there. I, I don't know the reason. I, I don't have a clue. And on the other side of that, it's the babies are born. It's, I don't want this baby. Here you go. And so we want to hunker down this morning on this is the title, Orphans Embraced. Now, I told you, some of you write me off right away, but I promise you, if you will listen, God will speak to you this morning. I, I want to read some things to you to set it in context. You still with me? Say amen. All right, three of you. That's good. That's kind of how I feel this morning, so that's good. All right. The, here, here's a little research. Bauckham has noted in his book, What He Must Be. Listen to it. Some startling statistics on fatherlessness. Now, I'm going to hunker down on men because there is one, and I want to talk to you. It's not a Father's Day sermon, but it's about children. Nearly 75% of fatherless American children will experience poverty before the age of 11. We'll deal with poverty next week. Compared to the 20% of those raised in a two-parent. In fact, fatherlessness is the number one cause of poverty in America. Let me say this to you again. Fatherlessness is the number one cause of poverty in America, and if you say, well, what's poverty? You can Google it, and it'll tell you what the poverty level is. Most people live in a poverty level. Do you understand this? In fact, fatherless is the number one cause, right? Although it happens on occasion, very few children are living in poverty with a father in the home. Because I can hear some dads going like me. I stay broke, though, right? But I'm talking about real poverty, real poverty. Children live in homes where fathers are absent. They're far more likely to be expelled from school. They're also more likely to drop out of school, develop emotional behavior problems, commit suicide and fall victim to child abuse or neglect. Fatherless males are far more likely to become violent criminals. I want you to listen to this last one. I'm going to read this story. But listen, listen. <laughs> Crazy. Fatherless males represent 70, 70% 70 of the prison, prison population serving long term sentence. 70% are fatherless males. There's, a, there's another uh, a percent that'll make up even a greater toward that 100% that have some kind of psychological issue. We talked about this last night, Sandra and I. But 70%, all because somewhere along the line, somebody said, I don't want you. Now, I don't want you to get too deep with stats. I'm going to preach, 
and I want you to be challenged. This thing's near and dear to my heart. I think one of the greatest things that I've had the ability to do is to speak to children. Now, I know it's because I got a child like mine, and that's okay, and you can make fun of it, and now they can make fun of it, but I like it. I want you to understand as an adult, if you've been offended, well, you can get over it because when we are talking, if a kid walks up, unless it's one of my two because I want to teach them right, kids rule here on this campus. They can interrupt any adult conversation at any time because a minute attention to a child is probably five more. Get the math there, all right? Crazy, right? A minute, just one minute attention to that child is more than they've got all week for most people in their life because we live busy lives. 70%. Did you know, in, are you still with me? Say amen. In America, there is over 400,000 foster children. In America, there's over 400,000 foster children. Did you know in the upstate here in Oconee County, that there is over 1,200 kids that need a home right now? Did you know that compared to that 1,200, there's just a little over 600 homes that are available for those kids? I want to give you Anderson and Pickens stats. They're crazy too. 400,000 fatherless children. Twelve hundred right here in our own front, side, and backyard. I, I want to challenge you <laughs> to make a difference. This whole series comes out of where the, 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 the guy that's an expert in the law, remember last week as I introduced this, for some of you who wasn't here, let me just give you a refreshing course. He, he says, what, what is the greatest commandments, right? And Jesus says, these are the two, and, it's the, and he says, the, ultimately love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then the guy being a smart aleck, being a guy that would try to find the loophole, he goes, well, who exactly is my neighbor? And I introduced this series last week talking about race, and racism, and prejudice, and being a bigot. Because Jesus would illustrate, he wouldn't answer them directly, he'd give them an illustration in a parable form, or a story form, and would use a race story about the Good Samaritan. And I've gotten several messages, immediately after service, I got text messages, and they were talking about, man, thank you, you with your words, we're on point. I, I, was, I was nervous, I remember, get this one, I, I was nervous before, when you introduced the subject and you started, you were nervous, I was super nervous. I told you last week, it's only been a couple times in my life I've been called honky and a cracker. I, I don't know anything about it, really. I didn't grow up in a home where it was to hate this or hate that or do this or don't do that. I've always thought I was chocolate on the inside. That's just how I roll. And so he says, this is, who is my neighbor? And, it, and I'm telling you, we live and we've built our church around this, that we are my four and no more, and this is who we're to love. And it's easy to neighbor those that are like us. It's easy to neighbor those that can somewhat help themselves. What about those that cannot help themselves? And so we start by breaking down these walls. We started with racism. This is taking these children that are right here, right here in our front, side, and backyard and doing something. He says, this is what I want my church to be. Multiple times did Jesus reference children. Multiple times did, did Jesus say, don't, let the, don't suffer them not. Let them come. Let them come to me. Let, don't stop them. And so I want to challenge you this morning to make a difference in this 1,200 right here in there, over 1,200 in our Oconee County. This is not, this is not a, a thing for adoption or fostering or anything like that. I just want to challenge you this morning. You say, well, how, are, how am I going to make a difference? I'm going to get there. But before I can get you to actually get off your duff and do something about it, i got to get you to see, just like I see myself, I've got to get you to see that you're an orphan yourself. As a matter of fact, I don't have it on the screen, and I'll put it up later if, if, if so, led to do so. Ephesians 1.5 says this, God decided in advance to, oh, watch this word, adopt us into his family. To bring us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and he gave him great pleasure. Before I can get you to make a difference in the kids' lives in this community and around the world, before I can get you to do that, I've got to get you to see yourself. This is how you neighbor. You have to see yourself as no more or no less than they are. You started out as an orphan. You said, wait a minute, I had a mom and a dad. Not in the spiritual realm. 
You were born under the endemic curse. And I want you to get this. This is so powerful for me, and it's so powerful if you'll let this sink in. Then watch this. God actually chose you. I mean, let that sink in for a minute. God chose you. You know, they say, because I, I married a school teacher, so I understand some of the rules have changed, but I remember when Bradley and I were going to school, and some of you that are my age and maybe older, that when we'd go out to recess or we'd have a PE class or whatever, they would put two captains, and the captains would choose the team, right? Y'all remember? Anybody ever experienced that? Well, for, for most of my life, I was always, uh, well, sometimes, most of the time, lot picked last. You ever had that? Yeah, you ever had that feeling that everybody else has gone before you? Maybe, maybe that's not that kind of setting now. Maybe there's a situation where you you always feel overlooked. You always feel like I'm the last. It looks like because here's what you do: you base your life off of what you think church is supposed to look like, what you think I'm supposed to do, what my wife's supposed to do, or you base it off what Facebook is saying about this person's life or that person's life. I've told you a hundred times, everybody puts the highlight reel on Facebook. Some air their laundry, God bless them, and every little thing they're going through, it's like every five minutes, let me post this, let me post this. I'm going to be honest with you, I could care less. That sounds bad, but I'm just being honest. Where's me out? I just hit hide. Yeah, I'm just kind of, this is the way it is. And before I can get you motivated to get involved, I don't, I don't guilt you into anything. I've got to see, get you to see yourself as that orphan that God chose, and God chose you. Did you know that Seneca wrote, and I'm not talking about Seneca, South Carolina, <laughs> but Seneca wrote that according to, watch this, according to, so the Roman philosopher Seneca, let's make sure I, you get this right. Seneca, or I don't know, you know, Seneca, all right. He described Roman culture during Jesus' time. Listen to this, quoting him. I've done my homework. Listen. We drown children who at birth are weakly and abnormal. You see, we, 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 we domesticate ourselves. We, we culturalize ourselves. We, we, we remove ourselves from the situation. And we forget that, listen, the world and even the modern Darwinists, they, they believe that the weak are not fit to live. That we come from a, an, a, an era where, listen, if you didn't measure up or if you didn't have everything just right, they'd drown you. You was no good. And here's what I'm trying to get you to understand is that above all that, here, all of that, God said, even in your sin, I'll die for you. That God chose us. That God has chosen me. And when we realize that God has chosen us to be adopted into the family of God, that we get full rights. Watch this. It makes us now a child of God. Most people struggle with something from their childhood. 70% of the population, male population, is from a fatherless home. They're doing long-term sentences in a penitentiary. Which means they've convicted, either a third-time offender, they've convicted, uh, committed um, an incredible act that they would get that long-term sentence, if not life, or double life, or on and on. You understand what I'm saying. Because somewhere down the line, even with uh, those of us that had a dad, there comes times that we feel like we don't belong or we're out of place. And what I want you to get, did you see, through God is that he chooses you. And when he chooses you, he says, not only am I going to choose you, I'm just not saying you're good. I I'm choosing you, and I'm saying, I'm going to make you my child. And when he makes you your child, because sometimes, even as an adult at 40, I feel like I don't fit in. And sometimes maybe you struggle with that. You say, I don't fit in. I don't belong. Nobody wants me. Look at everybody else's life going on. They're married and kids and careers, and they travel and this and that, and they can do it. And I hear you preach. I hear you. I want you to get, you need to back up to square one, the foundation of who you are is that God chose you. He predestined you. He foreknew you. I don't understand the depth of that doctrine, but my God said, before you were even a twinkle in your daddy's hour, before he formed you in your mother's womb, he said, I have chosen in you, even in your weakness, even in your misery and mistake, even with your faults and freckles. I choose you. And not only do I choose you, I make you a child of God. You're mine. And so when you walk through this world, you don't walk through as somebody that holds their head down like you don't belong or that you don't have something. Not only are you a child of God, the Bible teaches us that when he adopts you in, he makes you a co-heir with Christ. I mean, it's so hard for that to sink in our finite brains. 
We're so limited on the perception of all that God owns and all that God is. He holds the universe as plural. In the palm of his hands, the earth is his footstool. He says, you're mine, and what's mine is yours in Christ Jesus. So you ought to know that no matter what they said about you this side, or if you were picked last every time, or you felt like no one wanted you, that's okay. God said, I've already chosen you. I have a special plan for you. I want you to understand that one, every life is valuable. That's a good place for you to say amen. Every life is valuable. That's why I don't get caught up in political garbage. That's why you won't see me do any vlog. You won't see me do any posts. You won't say, vote the principles. I promise you, if you will look at the platform, it will solve your issue no matter if the person you like or you don't like. It is platform party down the line. I'm telling you. Why? Because we value life. Every life counts. Every life matters. What if in your birth someone would have said, or your mom or your dad would have said, nope, looks like they're not going to measure up, might as well throw them out. It's sobering, isn't it? Every life counts. And when I get you to see that you're as exact as every kid of the 1,200 plus that is foster care or in need of a home, then you will be motivated to do something in kids' and young adults' lives. It's easy to embrace them because I see myself in them. I asked Lana, you know our story? I'm not going to rehash our story. I, I could share multiple stories, but I asked Lana, I said, Lana, what, what, what would you say to someone that it finds themselves in that 1,200 plus or the 400 plus thousand enemy? What would you tell them now that you're in this season of your journey? What would you tell them? You, she would say to not give up. To not give up. You see how important it is for you to see yourself as those kids? Because it's so easy to throw in a towel. I'd love to quit. I quit most Mondays, bless God. I quit most Wednesdays. And every day in between. I've been doing it since I stood right over there, since we're in this gym, in that little corridor right there. And coach grabbed me up by my shirt and said, you're a JV superstar and a varsity nothing, and you'll be a quitter the rest of your life. I've, I've been quitting ever since. But every time I try to quit, God reminds me, I chose you. And then I asked my daughter, I said, what would you tell them? And she says, not give up. See, it's easy to get involved in the kids' lives when you see yourself as they are. But it's also easy to remove yourself and say, I was in a good home. I was raised this way. Wasn't perfect. I've got this. I've got this. I've got mine. And I've got to take care of mine. I, I don't want, and you say, why did you hunker down on the mail? Because most people will tell you anything, any, any organization that is most of the time the males that drag their feet and getting involved in other kids' lives. And it's such a powerful impact for a guy to get involved. I also, <laughs> I also asked Addie. I said, what's it meant to you to bring Lana into our home and to accept her as a sibling? She, she was saying this morning again about how it's, it's, it's you know, because she was an only child. It's great to have somebody to share things with, to talk with. But on the flip side of that, we fight sometimes, Dad. I was like, ain't nothing wrong with that. We all did that. We all do that. If I knew where my brother was and we had a conversation, it wouldn't take long before all the joy and ecstasy of knowing that he's here and that we can do life together again, it probably wouldn't take but a day or two. We'd still be fighting because we're Hendrix. We reminisced on the time we... We, before we made a decision to let God make the decision for us to bring Lana in as our child and, and, uh, 
It's a difficult thing, I understand, so stay with me. And I, I, remember, I remember telling Addie, Sandra and I were laughing about this this morning. We all get a chuckle out of it as we, as we reflect on it a couple of years ago. And we, we, we was telling Addie, and, and, and we've been going along with the Barnabas X, and we got, you know, we always, anyway, we've been involved. Addie's been involved with World Mission and, and, and uh, all kind of stuff for us. She goes, she goes so we're, we're getting, we're getting, we, we're, we're getting, we're getting a, a, a baby from Africa? No. Bless her heart. Y'all's from China, right? On this way. Listen, if I get you involved, I can't guilt you there. I have to guide you. To get you to get involved, because so, listen, they're, they're gonna be they're gonna be families that they can never have a biological child. It doesn't make you any less. God still chose you. You say, Well, I I, I don't God chose you. God's called you. God's equipped you. You said, well, I'm saying, listen, God's called you. God's chosen you. God's equipped you. And here's, here's how I want to end. I, I want to I wrap this thing up. Listen to me. Here's what I need you all to do. I need you to step up. I need you to step up and do something. You see, once you realize how much God loves you, and what he went through to adopt you by giving his one and only son to die on Calvary's cross and then three days later be raised from the dead and then spend 40 to the 50th day we're at Pentecost. Do you understand that he sends back the Holy Spirit to live? And so when you understand this, it, it will impact you. It will clarify on how much your life actually matters. Did you know, listen to me, listen to me, you, 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 you matter. You are of value. He wants you. And once you realize that, second thing that will happen to you and it will get you to step up and do something is it will make you sensitive to the plight of orphans and others around the world that don't have those in their life. They don't have the father figures or the mother figures in their life. After my mom died, it was an amazing thing happened at Corinth. An amazing thing happened, and it took a minute for it to set in. But all of these ladies in the church, these older ladies, I won't say elder because they're not elder, but the older than me, they just become mothers to me. There are some to this day that still check on me, they still, they still, when they see me, will hug me and treat me like they love, just like I was one of their own. It's an amazing thing, and when I get you to see yourself as that, you'll see how valuable you are, and then you will see, and watch this, you listen to me, I want to break it down in these last few minutes. When James wrote, because you thought I just left the text, give you a bunch of statistics and told you my story and try to guilt you, I'm not guilting you to anything. When James uses the word orphan, it literally in the physical sense denoted the idea, it, it had with it the idea that they're fatherless, the parent, they don't have parents, okay? But it also carries the idea with it, this word, it also carries the idea of someone that needs guidance or direction. It, it also denotes mentoring. And so what I need you to do is, as a church, is to be different than every other church, is to say, listen, I want to be like James, and I want to be like what the Bible says. I want to be that pure. I want to be that undefiled. I want to be that, 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 that organization, that, that family, if you will let me, that is doing what God has called us to do, and we will help those that do not have people to guide them, to direct them, to mentor them, to care for them. You say, well, how do I do that? I need you to speak up. I need you to be a voice. It's like I told you, look at the platform. We are pro-life people. Do you understand that? And the Bible teaches that at the moment of conception, it is a human being. And it doesn't matter the situation or the circumstances. It doesn't matter if somebody else didn't want. Every child matters. And you need to speak up because, listen, as, as, as beautiful as the noise that comes out of that baby's mouth, the goos and the gahs and the grunts, they don't have a voice yet. And so I need you to speak up on their behalf. I need you to say something. I need you to stand up. I need you to speak up. I need you to feed them according to what the Bible says. I need you to be an advocate for them according to Proverbs 31 8. I need you to defend their rights according to Psalm 82 3. I need you to feed them. I need you to close them according to Matthew 25. I need you to protect them against those that mistreat them. Isaiah 1 17. We're to share our resources with them. Luke 3 11, Romans 12 13. We are to find families for them. Psalm 68 5 and 6. 
Don't you think it's just me that's saying these things or some organization that's saying these things? It's the word of God that says this is you are valuable and every kid is valuable. And I need you to speak up. I need you to stand. I need you to, I need you to participate. Let me give you some practical ways that you can do that, right? You listen to me say amen. I know it's one of those that's kind of heavy, right? You're ready to go. I get it. I, I, I told you it's kind of mixed up in here. I get it. I don't think church is always happy clappy. I think it should be a challenge to you and stretch you and to get you out of the boat so you can walk on water. Because the fear that you have, and you say, listen, I could never foster. I can't get attached to those kids. Those kids will leave. Listen, I can promise you two things for a fact from every foster parent that I've ever known, even as far as when I started this journey with Tom Haslam and his beautiful wife, Shirley. They used to foster kids all the time. And he said, these two things I promise, it will hurt when the kids leave. I promise you it will hurt. Might as well go ahead. But I promise you, I promise you, it will be worth it. Can you imagine, even if you got one month, even if you got two minutes, even if you got two years with a child, that you brought them into a Christian home, that you fed them, that you clothed them, that you loved them, that you embraced them, that you showed them that whatever your, your idea of normal, because I, I, we've got a crazy house. You know, it didn't take long. I can remember Lana was quiet, sit on the couch, could barely get, I couldn't even hardly get a side hug. Now I can't get her to shut up. And man, I'm telling you, she, every night will drive us crazy trying to give us hugs and kisses before she goes to bed. And then she'll say, Dad, you're going to come tuck me in? I thought I'd just give you a hug and a kiss. No, 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 no. So top bump, bottom bump, every night. Makes the day make sense, and I promise you, I promise you. And just think if you had just a moment to do that, the impact on that kid's life. And some of you are sitting here this morning, and you know what it's like not to have that embrace. You know what it feels like not to have somebody love on you. You, have, you know what it's like not to have someone share the Word of God with you. You know what it's like to have to fend for yourself. I'm telling you there's a better way. I'm telling you, and that that 1,200 plus, if you and I would step up to the plate, absolutely could be dissolved in Oconee County. I need you to do practical things. Let, let me, okay, so let's do this. I'm not going to foster, right? You hear me say amen. I, I'll never adopt. I'm not going to foster. Let me, let me give you some practical ways you can do this, okay? One, you say, well, how can I get involved in kids' life? Well, here, just real, real soon, I'm going to introduce it right now. There's 609 kids through RCRI that will need sponsored this year, right? 609, I believe, is the number. This is pretty good for an old guy that used to be a dope head. It's pretty good. 609. $30 a child. 609. $30 a child gets them a blanket and a school bag. Now, I don't know what all is in that school bag, but I remember reading a blanket to keep them warm and whatever they need it for. And school bag. And I want us to make a dent in that 609. Can we get that whole 609? I say, sure we can. But if I can get 50 out of you, I'll be real happy. If I can get 100, I'll be ecstatic. If I can get 200, and on and on it goes. Do you understand? So there'll be ways that you can get involved. You've already been involved. There's the ways that you can get involved. There, there's, 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 I'm telling you, there's right here, right now, there's a thing called uh, 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 Dorian and Donnie. Will you stand up right where you are, please, right now? Just stand right there. Stand right there. It's okay. Look, stand right there. They, they initiated this. Thank you. Look at them. Everybody look at them. There's about 50, 60 of you here. Sit back down. Here we go. Listen. They initiated the One Love Ministry. One Love Ministry is a ministry that mentors kids, teenagers, students. They work through Jamie and Crystal's family and the, and the unit that's over there at Collins Ministry. You can get involved, spend some time talking to a kid. There's practical ways I wanted to end this morning with practical. Listen, you say, I won't foster, I won't adopt. Listen, do you know how expensive it is to adopt a child? Thousands of dollars. You say, I, 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 I'm not going to adopt a kid. Maybe you can help somebody raise the money to adopt the kid that God has brought in their home. That's how you can partner. Or maybe you could throw a shower for a, a family that's bringing a foster kid in or a, a kid from a part of their family that, that doesn't have anywhere else to live. Maybe, maybe you could throw a shower for those that, that, that are adopting a kid. You understand there's practical ways that you can step up, that you can stand up, that you can speak up, that you can be a voice for those that don't have a voice right here in this community and around the world. You can take the time. You, you, can, be, you can get signed up for respite care. Did you know something that I learned was interesting this week? You still listen. I, I was blown away that you can go and get certified or whatever you call it and be a guardian ad litem. 
And when I read about this and watched this little video about it, it is one of the strongest voices that that kid will have in their entire life. Matter of fact, they normally keep that relationship the rest of their life because it makes such an impact in them. You are their voice. You are absolutely what God says he would have us to do as he took us from being fatherless and made us children of the Most High God. You can get certified or whatever they call it as a guardian. You can become a foster parent. You know the story is an amazing story. Thad and Keisha are not here this morning. Baby A, you understand, is the sibling of Noah, uh, uh, of, of Lana. Uh, 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 you, understand, you understand how Christ, God, you just can't, I can't put it into words how if you ever doubted that there was a God and that he's orchestrating this whole big thing, that he would take these people from way out here, bring them in a little warehouse, and then in that little warehouse explode it up and bring these kids back through all kind of crazy drama, crap of the world and then along the lines here a family said we want another kid but we physically have one so we believe we'll foster and then here comes their sibling and lives in their house all because somebody said I want to be the difference in their life I want to be the church can you tell I'm slightly passionate about it because kids are falling by the wayside You get involved, get, get involved. You say, there's no way I could do that. I promise you, when we looked at it, no way, no way. But I'll tell you this, and I don't think I've ever said this. I, I had already in my heart, already in my heart, and, and Mom and I were talking. All three of them youngers were coming to our house. You don't understand, we have one full bathroom and one half bathroom. I did not, I, you don't pat me on the back or anything like that. God had amazing things, and then I get a message that says, hey, we're praying, will you pray for us? And we had not said a word to anybody, because we're just pastoring the family at this time. You, you, I'll tell you, you can make a difference. You can mentor these kids. And listen, what, 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 is, what is crazy about this whole thing is that, is that if we can be the church, if we could take a minute and take a knee and get on there, let's look them in the eye and love them. You know what kind of impact that would have? Do you, did, did you, have you ever told you that it's, it gets crazy sometimes? I get so caught. You remember a couple years ago, I think it was, it was last year that I had, I, I lost count of how many weddings I had. Did you know in the process of those weddings, the reason that I have so many weddings is because these kids that at one time I took a knee and would talk to those kids, that they've grown up and they said, hey, will you come, will you come perform our wedding ceremony? I can't tell you the messages I get in the inbox that says, hey, do you remember when you were at, at Lydia, or do you remember when you were at Corinth, do you remember when you opened door, do you, do you remember, do you remember when you preached over here at this, at this rally, or when you was down at Earl's Grove, when you, and on 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 it goes. All because I take two minutes to take a knee and look them in the eye and say, hey, somebody loves you. Or sometimes jerk them up by their nap and say, you need to stop doing that. That's not right. And God not have you live like that. You can make a difference. And listen, there's 609 kids that need a blanket and a school bag. There's over 1,200 kids in Oconee County in the upstate that need a home. There's only a, a little over uh, 600, I believe, homes that are open. There are, there are over 400,000. There are over 400,000 kids throughout this nation that need somebody to take some time to impact their lives. But let me, let me break it down. You, you ready? Let me break it down, and I'm done. Let me break it down even simpler and make it just absolutely applicable for you, all right? Hey, can we have all of our children and our babies? I know that we're somewhere ready to come in. Is our children and our babies ready to come in? Bradley, do you see them in the hallway? I know Rhonda looked in a moment ago. I want to make, make it super easy for you. They should come right over here. So if you'll be looking this way, I want you to see. And this is a light Sunday. You with me? Say amen. This is a light Sunday. This is not a heavy Sunday. This, our attendance is, is light this Sunday, and they're going to march those kids in right over here, and I want you to see every one of those kids, and I want you to take just a moment to, to look at them when they come in. I want you to understand that you can make a difference in these kids' lives, that you have an opportunity. Listen, yes, there's some all over the world. There's some in the nation. There's some here in upstate, but every week there, there is kids that walk this way. Now, while they're making their way out here, if you're a part of my student ministry, what I want you to do is I want you to stand where you are now. If you're part of the student ministry, Gen 1, I want you to stand up right where you are right now. Now, my adult leaders, thank you so much. Have a seat. Kids, stay up. 
I want you to look right here, and this is a light number. You average about 30 every week. They're not all here this morning. And adults, I want you to look, and most of you are involved, but you can get involved in your life. You know what they need? They need somebody to listen to them. They need somebody to tell them what they've gone through. Did you know one of the crazy things? Thank you, students. You can be seated. One of the crazy things that I learned as a pastor early on, I know you want to stand longer, baby. That's okay. You look good this morning, too. But watch this, is that I could preach for months, and then I could bring in a revivalist, and he would say the same thing I'd been preaching for months, and when he would leave, the church would go, Preacher, we need to be doing that right there. And I'm going, What? I've been saying that for months. You see, sometimes it's right in front of you. Sometimes the things that God is asking you to do, you say, well, I can't foster, I can't adopt, I can't do this, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You've got two minutes to throw some garbage down the gullet. You've got two minutes to listen to a kid. You show up on Wednesday night, I'll put you in a small group. Did you know that, that, that what I care more about than anything is not only leading my two daughters, but having other adults that my daughters can talk to because they're not always going to tell me. I want you to look at all these kids. And I told you this is the light Sunday. I want you to look at those kids and just bring them right about to here, Rhonda, and I want you to see all these kids. <laughs> Come on, kids. Come on, kids. Come on, kids. Come on. There you go. There you go. There you go. You don't have to sit down. I'm gonna let you go right. I'm gonna let you go real quick. And then it's gonna take a good gander at you. you can stand up. Stand up, baby. Stand up. Here we go. Look, 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 look. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Stay right there. Oh, they found the mama. Come on. I know, I know we may cause some cry. Listen, listen, listen. I want you to stay focused. Stay in the moment. Look at all these, look at these babies coming in. Look at these ones. Go ahead, go ahead. That's fine. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. All of them. All of them, all of them, all of them. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Here we go. Church, you still with me? Say amen. Church, you still with me? Say amen. Hey, I want you to understand. Look here, look at these kids right here. You don't have to send $30 overseas, though I want you to. You don't have to open your home to the 1200 that's in Oconee County. You don't have to say with the 400 that Listen, you got a handful. Of, give me a high five. Uh, you got a handful, more than a handful, that you can get involved, and they have to beg. Now, I'm not here to guilt you into anything. I'm not here to guilt you to, any, to do anything or to serve, but I want you to see the kids that need about two minutes, if not a half hour on Sunday and a half hour on Wednesday to an hour for you to invest in their lives. You can spend that much time on Netflix. You can spend more than that much time on Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. Can't you take just a couple minutes to invest in their lives, to be a guardian in their lives, to be a mentor in their lives? Some of you have been through this journey and can help them, guide them through that journey. You could be an asset to mom and dad, not something that would hurt them. And you think you can't. God's called you, and he's chosen you to make a difference in these kids' lives. All you got to do is to look. Look, look at those kids. Don't watch me. Look at those kids. All you got to do is see yourselves as those kids you needed a God you needed a mentor you needed food you needed shelter you need protection you need advice you need word all of those things come from God and God says listen look back at me now class now God says, I choose to use you to be that church. I choose you to do this to the least of these. And when you have done it to the least of these, you have done it unto him. You can make a difference. You can neighbor, and you don't even have to go outside these church walls. You can make a difference in these kids' lives. Amen? Amen. I see some prideful moms and dads. They sure could use your help. Thank you. You take them back so we can get them checked back in and we can let them go in a moment. Secure. Hey, Corey and team, will you come? Thank you, kids. Give them a hand. If one goes to freaking out because they've seen mama, that's okay. Just let them stay. You're in charge, though. Hey, listen to me, adults. Listen to me. Hey, right here, right here, listen, listen, class. You with me, say amen. amen. Investing in the life of one child won't change the world, but for that one child, it will change their world. People just don't need a family. They need a spiritual family. Can I tell you something that you're keenly aware of while I'm in this neck of the woods? Why don't you stand to your feet as we give invitation, please? There is no perfect family. 
Do you know that? There's no perfect family. There's no perfect family. Our family is not perfect. Our family has troubles. Our family has struggle. And the number one for my girls is they've got to put up with me. And that ain't even for you to laugh about, but you can laugh at it. It's just the truth. I'm a whole ball of mess. I'm still a work in progress. I got demons that chase me daily. I promise you. And you say, well, are you trying to be spooky? Hey, you can take that little, and I mean that figuratively as well. I got things that will not leave my brain alone. It torment me. Things that I've done, mistakes that I've made. You say, oh, that's been forgiven. I promise you. I promise you I get all that. I don't need your sermon from me, okay? What I want you to see and being very transparent for you to understand this is that I promise you God can use you. If he can use me, I mean that, and you hear people say that, but I'm telling you, if he can use me, I know he can use you. High school dropout, GED, could barely read and could barely write. Go back and get my GED. Go back to seminary and get my biblical degree. Go off to get another degree. I promise you, and I'm still not much smarter than I once was. I promise you. Somebody that was a drug addict, somebody that was an alcoholic, somebody that struggled and stressed all my life. I promise you, I promise you. And you may be sitting and go, listen, I'm all that. God wants you. If he wanted me, I know he wants you. And you say, well, how can I love them? I'm telling you, it's that main point. You've got to see yourself as these children. You can't just drop them off and pawn them off and let them go. I promise you, they need you in their lives. They're desperate for attention. They're desperate for affection. God will use you to make an impact on their lives. And you don't have to go around the world. You don't even have to adopt or foster, though I would love for you to get involved. You've got hundreds of kids right here that you can get involved. And you know the really neat thing is, I, I look at it and I go, how do you I don't know how to tell you. But I love Lana like she's mine. So you don't have to worry about what you love. I love, and I, I told, that's what I told Jennifer and, and Jason when I got, finally got to the emergency room the other night. You may not always see me at everything because I, I and my wife can't be at everything and we are not perfect. We may let you down a hundred times over. But one thing you can feel comfortable and be sure about is that when you come into my family, you belong to me. And when they're one of mine, they're mine. That's why they'll call me now to do their ceremonies. They're mine, and I love them. So how is that possible? I can only explain it by God, because I could care less prior to Jesus. I was a user and abuser, and got great pleasure out of your demise if it benefited me. You can make a difference. You can make a difference.